Hey, we want to thank you for joining us today for this Bible study. I'm so glad that you could join us. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your many blessings. Be with us as we open up your word that we might be inspired. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm really excited about the story for today because it's entitled The Parting of the Sea, and it's one of the spectacular events in the unfolding drama in the book of Exodus. And really look forward to that. Remember again part of our background about this Jewish little boy, Moses, who was spared by God, raised by Pharaoh's daughter, became an official, an Egyptian official, though he was a Jew, and in trying to save a Jewish man from the abuse of an Egyptian official, he ended up accidentally killing this Egyptian official. He ran and spent 40 years in the wilderness, and now he has been sent by God back to Egypt to deliver God's people from slavery in Egypt. This has finally happened. We had the Passover meal yesterday. Uh, the Jews kind of uh, were ready. They, they were prepared to leave on a moment's notice. They left Egypt. But guess what? Pharaoh decided that he wasn't going to let them go so easily. So he pursues them. His entire army pursues the Egyptian. For the entire Egyptian army pursues the Jewish people. And now they've got their back up against the sea. So on one side, the uh, Egyptian army, on the other side, the sea, they've got nowhere to go. Their backs are literally against the sea or against the wall of, of some sort. So this is the background. So let's take a look at this, and I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 14. So an angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, behind them again, that was where the Egyptian army was. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there was a cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light. Thus, the one did not come near the other all night. Again, so the Egyptians could not approach the Jews. They couldn't come in the middle of the night and kill them all. The Jews were safe. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night long and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall, one on the right and one on the left. The Egyptians took up the pursuit, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen in after them in the midst of the sea. And the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve and made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against us. So the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots and over their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and over the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned to cover the chariots and horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on the right and the left. And the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore, and Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians. The people then feared the Lord. And they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Here is the lesson. Well, this is a spectacular story and truly an action story, but the action is all God's, isn't it? And that's kind of a point. But let's take a look at the history of some numbers, some of the things that we missed between this lesson and the last lesson. If you actually take a look at the number of people that are listed, remember there are 12 tribes of Israel. And the Bible says that there were, if you actually add the numbers, oops, excuse me, there's maybe 600,000 of this tribe, 500,000 of this tribe. If you start adding all these numbers up, you actually come up with a number of 2.5 million Jews. I'm going to be frank with you. That's an absolutely absurd number. We know that historically, and archaeologically, Egypt could only sustain and only had a total of 3 million, 2.5 
I should say, the three million people total in all of Egypt from about 1500 BC till about 1000 BC. We know this for a fact. That includes the slaves. At any one time, only a maximum of 10% of, of those living and residing in Egypt were slaves. So it is an absolutely absurd number to think that there are 2.5 million Jews. At most, there were 250,000. But even that's kind of an absurd number. <laughs> so it is very unlikely the numbers are correct in, in the Bible. And it's not, however, that the Bible is trying to lie to you. Okay? This is what people are so simplistic and literalistic in their thinking when they approach the Bible. And they say, well, it, there were because the Bible says there are 2.5 million people. You're very literalistic in your thinking. This was a common practice amidst the people, not only the Jews, but amidst all the cultures to kind of exaggerate the numbers, to talk about greatness. These numbers meant something. They were symbolic in a way, okay? They were not thinking literalistically. And so when we come in a day and age where we're empirical and we want evidence, and we Christians go back and say, well, this is evidence. The Bible is telling us the truth. They weren't concerned about us coming to the conclusion there were 2.5 million people in all of Israel who were escaping Egypt. In fact, here's the, here, I'm going to show you the absurdity of this. It's a number of 2.5 million people. If you put 10 Jews, which is kind of typical in a, in a procession, 10 Jews side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and you actually had 10... 2.5 million of them, you would have a line 94 miles long. That's an absurd number. Come on. It's not about the numbers, okay? There were just not that many people in Egypt. There certainly weren't that many Jews. The biblical evidence, or I should say the archaeological evidence, even of Israel after they settled in Israel, does not indicate that many people settling into Israel. These numbers are not meant to be taken literalistically. There is a meaning behind some of these numbers. Sometimes they're just to indicate the greatness of the nation. And we see this again in every tradition, not just Israel. It is kind of funny, though, how we dismiss big numbers from other nations, but, oh, well, the Bible's telling the truth. It's not a matter of the Bible lying to us. Let me use an illustration. <laughs> well, actually, let me use a biblical illustration. In our Bible lesson from Sunday, Jesus was taught, told a story about a guy who owed 10,000 talents to his master. That's not a number that's meant to be taken literalistically. This is an idiomatic phrase. The biggest, the largest amount that they, uh, they could weigh, the Greeks in particular could weigh in terms of talents, money, was 6,000. So when you wanted to indicate a great number, a number that was beyond counting, 10,000 was the number that they would use. It's a typical idiomatic phrase. That doesn't mean he literally owed 10,000 uh, talents. It just means that he owed a lot, a myriad. And we find that we do the same thing. We say, well, there were, how many people showed up at the party on Saturday? There are millions of people. Well, there's, that's absurd. You know, I say this with my band. I, I used to be in a band called Splitter. And we'd go to a concert. Most of our concerts, we'd have five people. Okay, that's not exactly true. The band, we had five people in the band, so we always had two or three more people. Maybe there were eight people at most of our concerts. Um, and I came home one day, we had a lot of people. My wife said, well, how many people did you have at the concert? Millions of people, or maybe a hundred. I don't know, I didn't count. But sure, when you have a hundred people at a concert for Splinter, when we normally get two or three that are fans that come out to watch these concerts, that feels like a big crowd. So yes, these numbers are an exaggeration, but they're not meant to lie to you. Okay, so let's not take the Bible literalistically. Remember also, this story is meant to feel timeless in its nature. So it's not necessarily trying to communicate empirical facts, but it is trying to communicate something to us about what God wants to do. 
So again, Israel had their backs against the wall. The sea on one side, the Egyptian army on the other. The Egyptian army was preventing them from escaping. Now, Egypt in the Bible, remember how I mentioned to you that there is no way that we can identify who the Pharaoh is or what's going on or how this happened or what time frame this took place. And we just don't know. I think it's left like this, so it feels like a timeless story. Egypt itself in this becomes symbolic. Not to say that there is a truth to this. I'm not saying that there is an empirical truth. But what I am saying is Egypt in this story represents all the forces of evil in the world. Okay? This is what they're meant to represent. So this story is created for us in a fashion to make, give that timeless fashion. So even today, when we feel like we are bucking against evil, it's Egypt, okay? That's what it's meant to make us think. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. I am not saying that. But what I am saying is, it is given this timeless feel so that you understand the Bible is, even though it wasn't written about you and about our time, it's for you. That's why the details are not meant to be taken literalistically. But this represents all the force of evil, all the forces that would defy God. Now, we also know with the sea, the Bible doesn't tell us what sea it is. I know we're used to calling it what sea again? The Dead Sea. Well, that just doesn't even make sense according to the journey and the travel route that they were taking. If you look at the Hebrew, it actually calls it the Reed Sea. Not the Red Sea. The Reed. The Sea of Reeds. Um, this was then clearly not the Red Sea. We, uh, but we've just had such a tradition of calling it the Red Sea. We don't know what sea it is. It doesn't matter. The Bible doesn't care. Okay, it's just giving us a detail that they approach a sea, and the point is that God was delivering them from it. Who cares what sea it was? Again, it's just meant to be a timeless element to the story, and we're not supposed to be focusing on the empirical details and data because that's not what this is about. The point is, is that Israel has no options. Their backs are against the wall. They can't do anything about it. They need God's help. And so here we get a miraculous provision by God. Here's the point of the story. God's provision. It's not about the Red Sea. It's not about Egypt. It's not about what Pharaoh it is. It's not about the numbers of people. It's about the fact that God is going to provide for them. What does God do? God provides a pillar of fire. This pillar of fire protects them at night. It gives them light and it keeps them safe. God provides. Second, Parts the sea. God parts the sea. Whatever sea it is, it doesn't matter. Believe it or not, I, you know, uh, once again, not concerned about the empirical details or data. Number three, God defeats the army of the Egyptians. Of all the forces that would defy God, God defeats that army. So, this is a timeless story. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. It is written in a style and a fashion, however, that you can apply it to your life. So it becomes a timeless tale that means something 5,000, 4,000, well, it'll be uh, 35, so it'll be 2,000, so 3,500 3, years ago this might have taken place, okay? But it's a timeless story that's meant to be applied in your life today. That God provides us with a pillar of fire, will part the seas for us, will defeat those forces that defy God and prevent us from being faithful. This is a timeless story for you today. And this is what God promises to do for you. So here's the theological point. 
Here's the point. The timeless part of the story. One. Oh, you ready? <laughs> this applies to you. There's nothing special. Nothing special about the Jews. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So why did God choose them? Because they were willing to submit. Okay? And ultimately, God delivered them. Okay? This is the theological point that is being made in this story. There is nothing special about you. Well, okay, you're special to your family. You might be special to me. But remember, there's, what, seven billion people on this planet. You're not special, but you are to God. Because God chose you. And those who submit to God, God can do some spectacular things. God will deliver you. So here's what I think this means for me, this timeless, beautiful, wonderful story. I'm going to write a phrase that I want you to burn out of your brain because this is how I think it applies today. God, okay, I'm making a mockery of this phrase, never gives us anything We can't handle. Or God, maybe it's said God never gives you more than you can handle. That is the dumbest, stupid, most awful phrase that you can ever tell anybody. And it's just plain, simple, not true. The Jews had their backs against the wall. God gave them more than they can handle. There was no way they could be, defeat the Egyptian army. Look at this. God will never give you anything more you can't That is so stupid. Stop living your life by that stupid, non-biblical phrase. God always gives us more than we can handle. And guess what happens? God takes care of it. God takes care of it. We just had a uh, lifelong friend of my daughter who died, 24 year old. <laughs> she was over at her house almost every uh, single weekend, Friday till, till Monday morning she'd go back to school. And she was as much a part of our family as anybody, as anybody could be who was not biologically related to us. We were just devastated to hear about this. Um, this is a stupid phrase. You go up to that family who just lost their daughter. God will never give you anything more than you can handle. Bull. This family now has more than they can handle. You lose your child. That's more than any of us can ever handle. But God will take care of us amidst the things that we can't handle. God took care of the Jews. When their backs were against the wall, and they couldn't handle it. They could not defeat this army. They couldn't cross that sea. God parted the sea. God defeated the, the, the army. God often meets us in situations where we can't handle it, where we're not sufficient to the task. We can't take care of the things going on in life, but God is the one that takes care of it. This is the problem with this phrase. God will never give us anything more than we can handle. It's not about me handling it. It's about God handling it. So I'm asking you, if you are overwhelmed with life right now, if life is crushing down upon you, do you see the timeless nature of this story today? You may have more than you can handle. You do. Your plate is overly full. You are drowning right now. You've got your back against the wall. You've got the sea in front of you and the Egyptian army behind you. What are you gonna do? You can't do anything about it. You're sunk. But God will deliver us. Don't know how. Don't know when. 
but we do know that God will deliver us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for you to deliver us today. We know that all of us are feeling like our backs are against the wall, against the sea, and we've got a, the Egyptian army in front of us, all of those forces that would defy God. So in one sense, we, in front of us, we, we've got all of these natural phenomena that are just seeming to be against us right now, and, and behind us, the, the forces that would defy God, and we just feel surrounded right now. But we trust that you are going to deliver us because we can't. We have more than we can handle, but you are our sufficiency. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you got more in your handle. I'm asking God's blessing on you today. May God be with you amidst the things that you cannot handle. And may God deliver you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May God be your sufficiency. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.